Good morning. Good morning. This is uh, Friday, December, December, March 26th, 2021. I'm taking up today um, S99, which is actually a simple, fairly simple concept, which would be to um, lift the current uh, statute of limitations on child abuse. Years ago, we, a couple of years ago, we, I don't remember exactly when, we eliminated the statute of limitations on child sexual abuse. Um, but I believe that currently, and Eric will correct us, um, there is a statute of limitations on child abuse in three to six years from the time that it's discovered. Um, is that correct? Uh, that's right, Sandra Sears. It's three years, exactly. Three so. years. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, S99 would um, do what, what we did several years ago. Um, it has come up. Um, I believe it's Genesis, and uh, I wasn't involved in the drafting of it, but um, it's drafting was in a response to issues at the St. Joseph's Orphanage in Burlington. And then um, uh, the work. Uh, um, and then we recently um, discovered um, allegations of child abuse at the um, current Hatton School in Westminster. So, anyhow, um, some of our witnesses will speak to those and others will speak to the law. So I'm going to start off with Eric Fitzpatrick, who will uh, walk us through the bill. Um, and then we'll begin to hear from witnesses. Good. All right. Thank you, and Senator. By, Senator Baruth is a sponsor of the bill um, and may want to speak to that if you wish um, before we start off. Uh, no, I will just say that um, the St. Joseph's case was, um, was big news here and there's been an ongoing effort to do restorative justice um, at the site and with the players. And this came out of that effort. Um, so I'm, I'm approaching it in the same way we did the previous um, work we did on the statute of limitations on sexual abuse, um, but interested to hear the witnesses today. Okay, uh, go ahead, uh, Eric. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, this is, uh, for the record, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, here to do a walkthrough of the committee on Senate Bill Number 99, which is an act relating to repealing the statute of limitations for civil actions based on childhood physical abuse. As uh, Senator Sears and Senator Baruth were both just alluding to, this bill should seem conceptually very similar to members of the committee. It was only two years ago, 2019, in fact, that the, uh, this committee passed and then the entire legislature passed Act Number 37, which was H330 at the time that, that repealed the statute of limitations on childhood sexual abuse. You'll see that uh, as we look at the bill in a moment, really, as you mentioned, Senator Sears, conceptually, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same thing that you did in Act 37 a couple of years ago with respect to civil actions based on childhood sexual abuse. The proposal in S99 is to take that same measure with respect to actions based on childhood physical abuse. So the, the couple of key features of that we'll look at when we, when we look at the language of the bill, but that's the big picture. It's pretty straightforward. The, the current statute of limitations for um, physical abuse that would apply would be three years. So right now under current law for uh, these actions that would be based on physical, not sexual abuse, but physical abuse, uh, the statute of limitations period would be, <clears throat> excuse me, three years. That means three years from the time that a person discovered the injury, they, were, they discovered that uh, how the injury was caused, that they, they had that moment of understanding of where the injury uh, came from the three-year clock would start ticking. And um, the limitations period 
you may recall for actions based on childhood sexual abuse before you passed uh, Act 37 was six years. So that one had a six year limitations period after uh, consideration in committee and on the in the legislature, you, you removed that six year period so that actions could be brought at any time. So there wouldn't be any period. And that's the basically the same concept that is being proposed for physical abuse actions here. So having said that, a couple of related features to that that we want to look at, you know, primarily well, what, how do you define, what's the proposal about defining physical abuse? So that'll be uh, one thing you want to look, we look at when we look at the language. And also remember the, the concept of retroactivity. I mean, that was a big point back in the, the sexual abuse stat, uh, act that you passed as well. This idea that, okay, well, <clears throat> going forward, you know, ordinarily, when the legislature passes laws, they apply prospectively. They apply going forward. That's not to say that the legislature doesn't have the authority to apply laws retro retroactively. You do, but you have to be specific about it. You have to expressly say um, that the intent is to apply the law retroactively. And, and you did with uh, Act 37 with respect to sexual childhood sexual abuse actions. You said this is going to apply retroactively to any action and based on childhood sexual abuse whenever it occurred, any time in the past. So it wasn't just going to be based on actions in the future going forward. It would also be retroactive um, to actions that happened in the past. The, you made a, a distinction on that. And I'm mm. just telling you now because you're going to see this exact same thing. Senator Bruce, could you understand. take over for a few minutes, please? Sure. Thank you. Keep going, so you Eric. See, yeah, sorry. Yep, thank you. Um, so yeah, the point about retroactivity, which is in uh, law with respect to uh, childhood sexual abuse actions and also is proposed to be included in S-99 as well, <clears throat> is that when it's an action that took place that would have been barred by the statute of limitations, um, in other words, if it had happened so long ago that were it not for this law, the statute of limitations would bar it, would prohibit it. If that were the case, then you have a higher threshold if the action is against uh, an institutional defendant, a higher evidentiary threshold, that was with the decision that you made. And that, um, in other words, as opposed to against the individual who committed the abuse, no difference there. That applies retroactively, just as the same as applied going forward. It's a standard of negligence. Uh, but if it's an action against an institutional defendant, now remember the institution isn't the one was an individual person who committed the abuse. So the only way you could bring an action against that institutional defendant is either on a, either, there's two ways primarily. One, one would be negligent supervision, right? They knew about it and they, they negligently supervised their employee. Another way would be uh, on a, what's called vicarious liability, the sort of Latin term that we learned in law school is respondeat superior. That means that an employer is typically responsible for the actions of their employee that are carried out during the course of their employment uh, as a matter of law. And so they're automatically responsible for what, and by, by, when I say responsible, I mean liable, right? They can be sued for uh, the actions of their employee as long as they were carried out during the you know, ordinary course of, of their job and their res responsibility. So what you did was you said, okay, since given the, um, the change in law, of uh, essentially, and this is a, also a term that's often used in these sorts of cases, you're reviving actions, right? It's a revival of an action that has been barred by the statute of limitations, right? The legislature is deciding retroactively to revive this action because it's as of today, or as of say the effective date of the act, it's an action that would otherwise be barred because the statute of limitations period has run out, it's passed. Mm -hmm. So there, you may recall that long discussion in committee about sort of balancing interests when uh, uh, retroactively reviving actions that otherwise would have expired and where the legislature came down was to say, okay, for institutional defendants, given that uh, they're not the actual person who uh, committed the abuse, they're not the, the individual person, if it's an action based on this idea of vicarious liability, that they're only liable because they, they employed the person, um, then it's a higher threshold of evidence. It's not going to be negligence, it's going to be gross negligence. So you have to find that that institution 
was grossly negligent before they could be held liable. So um, that's a distinction in the sort of policy, policy grounds that you came down on back then. And that's the exact same proposal that you'll see in S99. Quick, quick question, Eric. Um, yes. In terms of, you know, in, in these cases, one of the things that we've seen, you know, in, in uh, the Catholic uh, church um, issue and, and others is kind of active covering up of evidence. Is, is that in a civil proceeding, is that considered um, along the lines of negligence or is that a separate category? Um, I think, I think that, uh, in other words, that they could be liable. Um, I'm just a, wondering a, under the two possibilities that you mentioned, it didn't seem like that was covered. Right. Right. I wonder if that might be a separate tort, actually, the, the fraudulent concealment of evidence, like a fraud might, might be even be separate, a separate, uh, claim. Okay. That, uh, uh, my, certainly not um, solely based on their employment of the person who worked there, uh, but right. it seemed like it might be a separate ground for an action there based on some sort of fraudulent concealment of evidence as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's the big picture. Um, at this point, it might be useful to take a few minutes to look at the language, and hopefully it will be consistent with what, what I've just been talking about, but then we can see, the committee can see the language itself before hearing from the witnesses. Does that make sense to go, go to next? All right. Sounds good. So okay, I'll pull up the screen. All right, so everybody see the bill? Yep. Great. So as I mentioned, this S-99, Act Relating to Repealing the Statute of Limitations for Civil Actions uh, Based on Child or Physical Abuse. I should have mentioned at the beginning, this is obviously nothing to do with criminal law, own, not criminal actions uh, by the state, but rather civil actions by, an by a person uh, who's been injured bringing an action for damages. So that's what, what uh, these sort of actions are referring to. And you'll see what's done here quite simply, pretty straightforward. This is the statute uh, that you passed two years ago, 2019, 12 BSA 522. Or I should say, sorry, that statute was on the books at the time, but it had a six year uh, limitations period, as I mentioned, for actions based on childhood sexual abuse. So um, what you did was amend it uh, to make that uh, limitations period essentially uh, go forward indefinitely so that there would be a repeal the, the six year period so that there no longer would be any, any time limit and those actions could be brought at any time. So all the proposal is in S99, quite straightforward, just changing uh, or adding, I should say, or physical abuse to the existing statute. So now the existing statute has no limitations period. And if you add in physical abuse, then that wouldn't have a limitations period either. So very straightforward. So you see the language, the operative language really is in subsection A, <clears throat> basically saying that an action brought by any person for recovery of damages for injuries suffered as a result of childhood sexual or physical, that's line 18, uh, abuse may be commenced at any time. So again, no limitations period, at any time after the act alleged to have caused the injury or condition. Um, and the rest of the language uh, is really doing the uh, precisely the same thing, just adding the idea that these um, uh, actions based on physical abuse will similarly have no limitations period, just as the sexual abuse actions do under this statute. So um, if you look further down, uh, this is a subsection B. This is a, an existing procedure that you may recall uh, in law that uh, if one of these sorts of actions is filed, the complaint is sealed by the clerk and it remains sealed until the answer is served. Um, or the defendant files a motion to dismiss. I think this is a particular um, uh, procedure having to do with privacy of the parties involved because these are maybe actions or, or, or often will be actions that involve um, you know, conduct that occurred a long time ago and sense of a sensitive nature. So that's why I think the legislature included these 
specific provisions about keeping the record sealed temporarily in the beginning. And then as you see in line seven and eight, if the claim is ultimately dismissed, then the, uh, then the papers, the complaint and other papers remain sealed. So that isn't changed other than again, making clear that it applies to physical as well as sexual abuse. Um, now, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, a, a key point here is to define what you mean by child with physical abuse. So uh, it's done in the same manner that uh, you did with the childhood sexual abuse provision. You see the sort of concept was to say that uh, it means any act committed by the defendant, and then you list several crimes that would have um, constituted, and I'm looking at lines 13 through 17, uh, at, for the sexual abuse provision, any, any act that would have constituted uh, lewd and lascivious conduct, L and L with a child, uh, felony sexual exploitation of a minor, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault. So if the conduct would have constituted one of those criminal offenses, that's uh, how you define childhood sexual abuse. So the approach for childhood physical abuse is similar. Um, basically says any act uh, committed by the complainant who, again, against a complainant, sorry, not by the complainant, against a complainant, when they were under 18 years of age at the time of the act, and the act would have constituted a violation of a statute prohibiting aggravated assault. So that was the, the, um, the parallel to the physical abuse situation to say the act, the conduct would have had to have constituted aggravated assault. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, take us right over to that statute so that you can see um, the aggravated assault statute see here is 13 BSA 1024. And then really the one that would be most applicable definition of aggravated assault is gonna be right at the beginning in A1. So a per person is guilty of aggravated assault if the person attempts to cause serious bodily injury to another. So any attempt to cause serious, serious bodily injury or causes such injury purposefully, sorry, purposely, knowingly, or recklessly under circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. So uh, that's the current definition of aggravated assault. The advantage you have of, of um, referencing uh, aggravated assault is that it's been on the books for a long time. Courts are familiar with it. They're familiar with, um, you know, the interpretation of the language and case law. So uh, you kind of have that as, as your... Um, background of understanding for cross-referencing it in, in S99. Eric, if I could ask you a question there on but, number yeah, one. Please. So an individual works at a residential treatment center in 1971, is um, and working there, um, physically restrains a kid who's under the age of 18, um, we don't know that there was any damage done. Um, back then, there wasn't. There aren't good records of restraints. There aren't much to go back on to. How does one prove number one that that, that the um, act was reckless or um, extreme indifference to the value of the human life when they were trying to restrain him because he was completely out of control and was a danger to himself or others. And now, 40 years, 50 years later, uh, I guess 40 years, 50 years later, <clears throat> somebody comes and sues that program or that individual. But was there their attempt to cause bodily harm? Well, that's the, but I guess the issue is, um, how do how does one defend oneself in cases yeah. like that that are fifty years old? I think I got my math right. Yeah, I think that was fifty exactly, Senator Sears. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think you've hit on on uh, you know what is the uh, an issue that is uh, very relevant to to these situations when the same thing was discussed last time when you when you revive an action that would otherwise have been extinguished by a statute of limitations, you could be going back quite a ways and you and you run into proof problem. And um, you know, I don't think there's any way well, around that. Uh, yeah. um, and, and it becomes sort of a, a 
a policy decision for the legislature, as, as it is with the limit, statute of limitations generally, is that one of the main reasons for even having them at all is exactly that, that uh, uh, you know, one of the policy justifications for statute of limitations in general is that people's memories fade, uh, proof disappears over time, uh, access to evidence is harder to get. Uh, so those are um, facts that, that I think you're right to, you have to take into consideration when, when, you, when you balance that with the, with the nature of the harm in the particular case. I think you know, that's, well, later on uh, in three, it says, for a purpose other than lawful medical or therapeutic treatment. Mm -hmm. That's a drug, uh, right, that's not, <laughs> not, not a physical restraint. Correct. I, I'm, you know, <clears throat> I only did three of them, but um, I don't believe anybody got injured. Uh, but some programs were doing um, lots back, back in the day. Um, and there may, you know, that may have been something that uh, I just, I, I um, fully support the ability of somebody to, who, you know, was physically abused in a St. Joseph's or any such place, uh, having the ability to come back and, and deal with that. But on the other hand, you don't want, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know how one defends oneself or I don't know how one proves there has been physical abuse other than if there was a medical record Limb or I think and more importantly, reason. though, Senator, I think is the question of how do you defend in such a situation with the phrase attempts to cause serious bodily injury to another? That's a perception uh, situation if there's no record of it. So someone could come back and uh, bring an action, if I'm reading this correctly, after 40 years and how does one defend oneself given the lack of any kind of evidence other than the allegation? That, that's where the, it just, it, because aggravated assault involves the attempts, um, whereas causing such industry, injury, probably there would be some uh, medical record or some other way. Yeah. Uh, Anyhow, Senator Baruth. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the burden of proof on the person who's suing? Yeah, but it's by a preponderance of the evidence. No, I get that. But what I mean is, if anybody's disadvantaged by the extreme amount of time and the example you gave, it's, mm -hmm. it's more the person who's suing um, runs up against that. Obviously, the defendant does too, but to a lesser degree. Um, so I, I remember this discussion from the last time, right? Where we were talking about it, and and at least my memory is that we were we were acknowledging that there was problems in both sides launching either a prosecution or a uh, not a prosecution, but a uh, a civil suit or defending against it. But it was more on the person who had the burden of proof. Right. Um, so that was why I, I thought yeah. it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't unfair to the people who might be sued. Um, I'm, all, I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, perhaps witnesses will respond to that concern. Um, I, and I'm, I'm more concerned with the attempts language than I am with the actual causes of such injury. <clears throat> I was attempting to restrain the individual because he was completely drunk. And if I hadn't restrained him, he could have died from, you know, his own vomit. Um, yeah, it goes, I, it's, you know, I, I understand your history, Dick, with um, 201 Depot. 
But I'm, I'm thinking now I served as a camp counselor uh, for kids who were mentally challenged. And there were oftentimes some of the more seriously challenged were acting in such a way that if you didn't uh, attempt to restrain them, they would have had injured themselves or others. Yep. And as a teenager in that situation, um, you do what you can and hopefully have enough training to understand the difference between uh, acting in a way that would cause somebody injury, but it's the perception of the plaintiff in this case that somebody attempted to seriously bodily injury uh, that has me a little queasy here. Yeah, and I think it's the attempts that bother me more than the uh, causes. Right. So, Eric, if you just kind of keep going. Um, I... Yeah, but I'll, I'll flag that point. Senator Sears, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, we're just about done with the walkthrough anyway. But So that was the definition. We'll return ourselves to the language of the bill now. Again, that, that definition was help, was mm -hmm. uh, important to yep. look at because that's how you define what childhood physical abuse is. Right. The, um, and the last point is really the point that I mentioned also, the retroactivity point. Uh, that, that I mentioned at the beginning. And this is the idea that, uh, again, this doesn't, generally speaking, when the legislature passes a law, uh, it applies uh, prospectively going forward. Uh, 1 VSA 214, which is the statute you see referenced in existing law there on line one and in S99 on line nine, is the Vermont statute that says exactly that, that generally laws don't affect uh, rights that were accrued prior to the effective date of the act, they only apply prospectively. And the Vermont Supreme Court has held squarely that 1 VSA 214 means that applies, that laws generally apply prospectively. So if you want to apply laws retroactively, the legislature can do that, but it has to be explicit, has to be expressed. And that's why you have to notwithstand 1 <laughs> VSA 214 the same way you did uh, in 2019 in the language above. So what you say is notwithstanding 214, in other words, notwithstanding the fact that laws generally apply prospectively, in this case, it's applying retroactively. You say that expressly on line nine, and it applies retroactively um, to child physical abuse that occurred prior to July 1st, 2021. That's, a, that's the, as you see below, that's the effective date of the act in line 18. So any uh, abuse that occurred prior to that irrespective of any statute of limitations in effect at the time the abuse occurred. And again, this is just exactly the same language that you have in the subsection above with respect to actions based on childhood sexual abuse. Um, and again, the second point is the one I also mentioned earlier, but if the action is, is, uh, would have been barred by a statute of limitations in effect uh, on June 30th, 2021, I'm on line 13 now, damages may be awarded against an entity. Remember, this is the institutional defendant point that I made against an entity, an employed supervisor had responsibility for the person allegedly committing them. There's a typo, by the way, in line 15. That sexual in line 15 should be physical. It's a leftover yeah. from tracking the other language. So that should be physical abuse. Uh, so the damages may be awarded against the entity committing the physical abuse only if there's a finding of gross negligence on the part of the entity. So in other words, there's that higher evidentiary threshold um, against uh, when, when the entity is the defendant as opposed to the individual person. It's not just negligence, it's gross negligence. Um, and again, uh, effective date of July 1st, 2021. And uh, I think that's it for the walkthrough. Eric, can I just red flag something? Could you scroll back up to the portion yeah. that had um, sealing of the documents until either an answer was filed or a motion to dismiss was heard? Sure, yep, right there, I think. Um, Senator Sears, I'm not familiar enough yet with the new e-filing system, but yeah. what I, and it's only because my area of Vermont is brand new to it, literally two weeks ago, uh, and we have Jerry O'Neill here that may, he may be able to answer this question, but in order for me to file a response to something, and in this case, it's either a, a motion to dismiss or an answer, there has to be a document on file at the courthouse that has been entered in through the Odyssey system. And in order for me to find the place where I need to make a file response, I have to go into what I'm assuming right now is a public document. 
Uh, in other words, a portal that gives me the ability to locate a case that's been filed and respond to it. I've never done it in a civil proceeding yet, but I would like to get the answer to the question, are we capable of doing what this is actually calling for in the new Odyssey system? I just want to make sure and give me some- I heard there's some problems with items that are supposed to be sealed in the criminal docket. Uh, yeah, I just I want to make sure I have some peace of mind that we can actually accomplish where the information that the defense has used. Right. I, I don't know. I, that's a good question. Um, I thought I thought John Campbell told me that they had solved that problem. But whether they have or not, I know there was information that um, was out. You know, that, that wouldn't have normally. Yeah, I, I just heard yesterday that a um, a defendant tried to get into the system and couldn't find what the prosecutor had already found. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's something there that I don't quite understand yet. Yep. But the point of all this is we're trying to make sure something remains confidential until either an answer or a motion to right. dismiss has been filed and heard. Yep. I hear you. Um, I don't know. It just went on live up in Chittenden too. So they may not know, but we can find out. Wyndham County's had it for quite a while. We can find out. Um, Eric, maybe. Um, um, Do you want me to check with Judge Grierson or something? Yeah, you can check with Judge Grierson if that's yep. going to be a problem. Good pickup. Other issues for Eric before we go to our first witness? Um, our first witness is Jerry O'Neill, an attorney with Gravel and Shea, and um, who uh, testified um, back when we did two years ago when we did the statute of limitations on child sexual abuse. Welcome, Jerry. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you. Um, I'm always grateful to appear before the committees because I find, particularly with the Judiciary Committee, there are genuine, real questions trying to find answers to problems, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be a part of it. Just a quick bit of history. Uh, I have represented uh, survivors of sexual abuse since the late 1980s, child sexual abuse since the mid-1990s. Uh, I have pursued cases against the Burlington Diocese, um, since the mid-1990s, and just a full disclosure with respect to it, uh, I have right now pending eight cases against the diocese. I don't think that affects in any way what I'm saying here, but there is a, ultimately a limited amount of money there, and I recognize the existence of implicit bias, and so I simply mm -hmm. want you to be aware of that as I go forward with respect to it. I want to just, if I could briefly, looking at my notes here, try to address just a few of the technical issues that have been brought up. Eric has done his usual masterful job of going through the bill, explaining it. I learned some things as he went through and did it. If I could just add a few quick points. The statute of limitations is exactly as he said for physical abuse, aggravated assault, physical assault in any respect, three years, that would mean that someone who was abused as a child under current law would have until the age of 21 because they have three years from the date they achieve their majority and Vermont majority is currently 18. So therefore um, that makes it 21. To the issue that Senator Benning raised with respect to sealing, timing is this perfect on this because yesterday afternoon I filed a civil case involving an entity and an individual who we were alleging were negligent and thereby permitted the sexual abuse of one of our, of our client. And we had difficulty getting it filed in the Odyssey system. My legal assistant called and said, under the statute, this has to be sealed. We didn't care if it was sealed or not. It's, it's filed as a Jane Doe, but we wanted to make sure that the court clerk's office was aware of what the statutory requirement was because they could easily miss it. There was no way that they could figure out how we could file it through Odyssey and accomplish that. Ultimately, we filed a letter. We put a letter on top of the pleading, just simply explaining what the statute was and what was required, which we think will mean that the sealing will in fact take place. I think the history of the sealing is in substantial part to protect a person or entity 
so that if the case is filed, there isn't suddenly a headline somewhere that some person or entity has been sued for child sexual abuse, but rather there is a basic procedural piece, which is to say a decision as to whether or not there is, if a motion to dismiss is granted, then it's forever sealed. So it's pr for the protection of the entity being sued in connection with it. I believe that's the, the part of it. There was also a question, Senator Baruth raised the question, if there was a cover-up, would that be a separate claim? The, the cover-up from the perspective of one who has tried, I think, eight cases against various entities, five of them against the diocese here, um, the, the cover-up is very strong evidence of the underlying actions, of course. It could be a separate claim, but fundamentally, it's in my experience, is invariably going to be strong evidence of the events themselves. Um, and in fact, they, they could, depending upon what was done, it could toll the statute of limitations if the information was hidden in some respect. I want to talk briefly about the issues Senator Sears has raised. Uh, those are thoughtful issues. I think, if I read, as I read the statute, the key piece with respect to it is that it has to be, for example, I think the, the issue of the restraints, I don't see how anyone can make a claim work on the basis of that, because it has to be an intention to cause an injury or recklessly acting recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. Those are really high standards. And so to go back and say that either in the context that Senator Benning was talking about or Senator Sears, that the conduct they described would fit within this legislation, I, I don't see how it could. And ultimately, the burden of proof is on the person bringing the case. I have, I've probably talked to over a hundred survivors of childhood sexual abuse. My attitude is I'll talk to any crime victim, see if I can help them, spend time with them, point them in the right direction, whatever it is, whether I can actually do something for them or not. And a lot of the times I say to them, I believe every word you're saying, I have no doubt about it, but the proof, we, we can't prove it because you do need to prove it. A jury is not, in my experience, going to come through just because someone makes the allegation, find in favor of someone. They have to have some level of proof it may be corroboration through other witnesses, it may be documents, but it's not going to be simply because the claim was made that they're able to succeed with respect to it. And talking about the restraints issue again for just a moment, if we think about it, and I know each of you who has paid attention to these is fully aware of these, which is that if you bring a claim for civil damages, you need to prove fundamentally three things. You have to have a duty you have to have breach of the duty, and you have to have damages. Proximate causes, it's called, fits in there somewhere between the breach of the duty and the damages. This is to say the breach caused the damages. But in the instances that you're talking about, I would find it very hard to believe, even if someone could meet the very high threshold of this statute, that they would ever be able to show that they were damaged in some respect. I mean, I know of people who have come to me. I spoke with somebody day before yesterday, and you know, not this context, but another one where the person has a breach of duty, a duty, a breach of duty, but the damages are minimal. And unless that person's physical condition gets worse, that will not be a claim that will go forward. So there's a lot of screening of cases. I mean, there's a lot of time and effort on it so that lawyers, particularly here in Vermont, don't bring haphazardly cases. And this statute as written, or the proposed statute as written, is such that it's not an easy proof with respect to it. It will be a challenge to bring cases under this statute in most instances. I am not aware of any case I have ever seen that I think could succeed under this statute. And that sort of brings me to a matter of some concern. I have spoken with the survivors of abuse at St. Joseph's Child Center since the mid-1990s. I've spoken with them as recently as this year. Individuals, groups, uh, this is a group of people who were very poorly treated in an atmosphere for which there is no excuse. Um, my concern with respect to it is that if, as the legislation goes forward, not to give false hope that the statute or the proposed statute as it's written 
would permit recovery for them. Because as a practical matter, I don't think it would. The primary drivers of the abuse, as I understand it, were an order of nuns who decamped back to Montreal in 1975. And so if there's a claim against the diocese, that will be somewhat different. But a claim against those nuns, in my judgment, is not going to, very unlikely to be successful, absence of witnesses at this point, but also you have to get a judgment, get a Canadian judgment, collect on it. I have a $30 million verdict, a judgment, against a father for the sexual abuse of his daughter. I tried that case over three days. I'll never collect a nickel on it because the person's judgment proof. And so in the same circumstance here, if someone wanted to make a claim for the abuse that took place with those nuns, I don't think it's collectible. I hope if they succeed and they can collect on it, that would be a wonderful thing. As you look at the legislation, one of the things I think to have in mind is that many of those who perpetrate abuse of children, the greatest percentage of them personally, the people who do it individually, are people against whom you'll never collect. I have collected against some of those individuals, but that's the exception in child sex abuse cases, exception rather than the rule. And if we look at what aggravated sexual, excuse me, aggregate, aggravated assault is, I mean, that is a very high level of abuse of a person. And most of the people who commit that type of offense hopefully will go to jail. But secondly, they don't have anything in the way of assets. So there's not anything to collect about. So I simply suggest that as a sense of perspective with respect to it. Anything you can do. Yes, Senator Bruth. Did you? Yes, sir. No, uh, Senator Bruth. Sorry to interrupt. I, I, okay. I did want to ask about um, if you think it would be very difficult to collect against that group of nuns, um, what would be your sense of the gross negligence standard and a suit against the diocese? Well, the question will be, I don't have a full grasp of the interrelationship between the diocese and the order of nuns. My perception of it is that the diocese was the entity through Vermont Catholic Charities that was responsible for the orphanage. And the question would be whether or not, first of all, let's assume that there was physical abuse that would meet the language of the statute by some of the nuns, or so let's keep it at the nuns just for a moment. And in that case, the question would be whether or not the diocese had a duty, given the fact that it was in charge of the diocese to make sure this didn't happen, put it in non-legal terms. The answer, I think, to that would be yes. The question is whether or not the, the diocese was grossly negligent in its supervision of the operation of the diocese, excuse me, of the orphanage. If it was possible for a survivor to show that they met this physical abuse standard that is set out here in, in the proposed legislation, and that the diocese was grossly negligent in its supervision of the operations of the orphanage, I think the answer to that's yes. Uh, it's pretty clear to me. Okay. But those are the steps that you have to take. Uh, you have to show that there was a breach of the duty of supervision with respect to it. It helps to have notice, but that wouldn't necessarily be a requirement because the, the diocese has a duty to supervise its own operations. Did I answer Thank your question? You did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Go ahead, so, please. Anything that, that you can do my goal is, is, is pretty simple, which is, same as yours, prevent any child from ever being physically or sexually abused. And so this legislation has the possibility of permitting individuals who have been physically abused to collect damages for what was done to them. It's a really high standard in the bill, and I think it will be really hard and unlikely someone will if it creates a, a further deterrent effect that's great. I think that the criminal statutes we have in place already, already are the strongest deterrent we can have for that. I'm totally unfamiliar with the circumstance, or I shouldn't say totally, only in passing familiar with the situation of the current Hatton home. I don't know whether or not there's, this bill would permit any recovery there or not. I simply don't. Do we have a, our next witness can uh, talk 
talk specifically about Kernan. Good, good, excellent. So I have, hope I have answered the questions that you may have with I, respect to it. Um, I think that there's, when trying to prove an attempt, and when that, I, I, I guess I'm kind of hung up on the attempt language there. Um, wouldn't that be difficult in a civil case to prove attempt? Speak a little bit to that. The, the, because yes, there wouldn't uh, be any damages, right? Well, first of all, you, you have to show attempt to cause serious bodily injury or a t alternatively acted causes injury recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. I, I mean, any of the scenarios that I have heard so far don't come anywhere near this because, for example, uh, let's assume it's a restraint situation and it turns out that the individual suffered some damage or injury as a consequence of that restraint. Well, are they going to be able to show that this was an attempt to cause serious bodily injury? Of course not. These restraints were for purposes of protecting the individual. Was it done recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life? No. And they'll never be able to prove that. So I don't think the situation involving restraints, at least in the ones that I've heard here, which are done in a good faith effort to try to assist someone, come anywhere near close to anything that would permit a recovery under the statute. And if there's already been a recovery for physical damages, would that preclude a continued a different suit? In all likelihood, yes, because it could be either that the person assigned a release and getting out from behind a release is quite complicated. I won't go into it here, but it's very unlikely. Well, I, they... Years ago, when we used to um, split and sell firewood, a young man lost a finger in a mm. splitter accident. Um, mm. it was completely accidental. He was able to, to sue and our insurance company did pay the damages. I'm just curious if he would now be able to since, I, since he had already collected. Well, I, I think there's a couple deserved, of, I mean, I think he deserved to get, you know. I'm sure that was a just an ordinary negligence case, which is some allegation of negligence yeah. in connection with the operation of the splitter. Yeah. I don't see anything under, first, I don't see anything under this statute that would come anywhere close to permitting a recovery because this is all intentional or highly reckless acts, one, and two, to the extent that he recovered for that particular incident, he sued and recovered for it, I don't see any chance that he could bring another action. Thank you. I guess those, were my, Excuse yeah, me, th those were my questions, uh, Jerry. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us again this year and uh, best to you. Thank you, thank if, you very If much. you think of other things as the, the hearing goes on or later on, bring them to our attention, please. <laughs> on Thank back you. when we do uh, the markup of the bill and so forth. The, yeah, the passage of the, of, the, of the statute of limitations abolition with respect to child sexual abuse claims was a wonderful thing for the people whose claims probably would have expired. And so if there is a way in which you can bring this legislation forward that will permit people like the survivors of St. Joseph's Orphanage or those who may be involved with the current Hatton Homes, it's a wonderful thing because it really changes their lives. And I don't mean it in terms of money, but I mean it in terms of how they see the opportunity to achieve some level of justice. Appreciate Thank that. you very much. Uh, yep, yeah. and we will invite you when we do markup of the bill and if you join us great if you can. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is Kim Doherty, who um, is co-founder of the and a partner in the Justice Law Collaborative and an MSW. Masters in Social. Kim, welcome once again. Good morning. Thank you so much, Senator Sears and, and everyone for the opportunity to, to speak with you all today. Um, I do have a brief presentation that I will attempt to share. Um, I just wanted to um, thank, thank you all for leading the country, at least in, with respect to the sexual assault 
changes. Um, you know, I in the past was a social worker um, involved in New York back in the late 1990s working on child abuse uh, cases involving sexual and physical abuse and went on to get my law degree and continue to advocate in these types of cases moving forward and have represented gymnasts um, uh, who had claims involving Larry Nasser. Um, you know, unfortunately, other states have not done as well of a job in terms of opening uh, the ability to bring lawsuits retroactive, retroactively and many of the other states are simply opening windows that may provide some opportunity for uh, people to get justice, but certainly does not come near what you all are doing for sexual assault survivors and what I see you attempting to do here now for people who have suffered from physical abuse. So I thank you for being a leader across the nation and in, in these types of actions. Um, I, I, I share um, the same philosophy as Attorney O'Neill in terms of any concerns that you may have over bringing you know, attempted causes of action, um, attempted uh, injuries, because, you know, uh, as you all know, we, we do listen to every one of our clients and we do want to try to get justice for every single one of them. But, you know, we also understand we have the burden of proof. And if we can't prove a case, we're not going to be able to bring it. Um, and it's unfortunate and you want to help everybody, but um, you know, it's, it doesn't make good business sense from a law firm to take on a case that ultimately will not, uh, not succeed. Um, so really ends up not being a great use of our time. So I, I have the same sentiment that I don't believe there will be, you know, lawsuits brought that aren't provable under the, the sort of attempted aggregated, uh, aggregated um, assaults. So I am going to see if I can share my screen now. Let's see, share screen. Okay. Let's see, can you all see the screen now? Nope. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So oftentimes when these discussions come up across the nation, um, the, the general public believe that physical abuse, child, childhood physical abuse is the thing of the past. And unfortunately, that's, as you all know, just not true, um, particularly with the environmental factors that have come into play over the past few years. It has actually been uh, on the increase here. Um, this is a, is a slide that shows uh, the visits to the emergency room in 2020. As a result of COVID, um, the way that they were tracking abuse had to change. And so the studies uh, that the experts were looking at is, is how many people were going to the emergency room uh, with issues of potential child abuse. And so the bottom part of the screen shows the increase between 2019 and 2020 with respect to emergency room visits. And you can see that it's, it's a drastic increase when you look at the emergency visits for, that were related to suspected or confirmed child abuse and neglect versus other types of emergency room visits um, that were taking place in 2020. Um, there's also a statistic here from 2018 um, that is establishing how this has been a problem as recently as 2018 with 3.5 million children mm -hmm. being involved in maltreatment um, and 700,000 determined to be substantiated. So if there's any doubt that this is a timely bill, um, I think you all can see that it is. So the, the other issue as it relates to, to COVID um, is that there were a significant decrease in the number of reported cases. And as you all can imagine, that's because now these children are no longer in schools, they're no longer in settings where there are mandated reporters who are able to come forward um, and make a report on behalf <clears throat> of the child. So that resulted in less reporting. Um, there was also less oversight by these state agencies who are now stuck in their homes doing their jobs, um, you know, as we all have been um, from our homes. And so, you know, the, the studies we believe are going to show in, in, that 
the lack of oversight also has allowed the increase of, of child abuse to take, to take place across the country. In addition to that, where people who lost their jobs were now home, a lot of them turned to substance abuse. Again, another way of increasing the uh, abuse within the family and the issues that took place uh, including domestic abuse. So I think what we're about to see in the future as these studies uh, get completed is a significant increase in abuse that has taken place in this past year. The emergency room visits alone on the prior slide have already borne that out. The sad part of this is that these environmental issues often won't show themselves for many years or decades. Um, the effect of it, if there isn't reporting, um, is, that, is that the people who are abused go on in later in their life and attempt to self-medicate, and that's where their life starts to go downhill. If they don't have an ability to come back um, and right the wrongs that have happened in these cases, um, you know, their, their lives can just very well go downhill quickly. Another environmental factor that we have prior to COVID was the opioid uh, pandemic that we have across uh, the nation. Uh, the studies that they that have been reviewed show that there is elevated rates of child maltreatment and child welfare uh, related primarily just to the opioid misuse. Um, sometimes it goes undocumented, just like with COVID. But these are real issues that establish that childhood abuse is not a thing of the past, um, and we are going to see the effects of it. Vermont is not spared from the nationwide statistics that show that child abuse continues to rise. Uh, this is another slide that shows from 2018 that 1,200 claims were substantiated. These are the reports from 2019. Again, pre-COVID, there was more reporting, um, but over 20,000 reports were made. 25% of those, over 4,000, uh, resulted in child safety intervention and then 5% resulted in opening and ongoing services. This next slide shows something similar in terms of the 25% being investigated or assessed. Um, and the low rate of 5% of, uh, actually resulting in any type of oversight and substantiation of the claim. You know, part of the issue is that the workers within the Department of Children and Family Services are really spread too thin to evaluate um, you know, those other 75% of investigations. So when they're deciding between which ones to investigate and resulting in only 25%, it's because there's just not an ability to investigate every single claim. In Vermont alone, um, the department workers take on an average of 6.2 cases each when the national practice and the best practice is 12 cases. Um, part of the issue here too um, in reporting is mandatory reporters can be the ones abusing. I think we've seen that in the institutional cases. They don't have an interest in uh, reporting the abuse that they see or that are that is brought to their attention. Um, and children are obviously not in the position oftentimes to report themselves. Part of the initiative that I understand of Senate Bill 99 was this epidemic of institutional abuse within the state of Vermont. I think everybody understands um, what that's like. Uh, St. Joseph's Orphanage has already been discussed. Uh, you know, 120 years of abuse, mutations, murder of children is, is, is a serious issue. And, and, I, and I share Attorney O'Neill's concerns on collectability uh, in that case. And you, know, you have to really look closely at whether this bill will allow for any diocese potential uh, collectability. But for me, I believe that this is just one example among many others, including the Catholic Church, where 40 priests were credibly accused of physical abuse and sexual abuse. And now as recently as today with Kern Hatton, these are just examples that have made it to the public. I'm sure as attorney O'Neill will tell you, many of our cases never see the light of, uh, you know, the news. Oftentimes these cases um, are filed or are um, 
settled or resolved prior to filing and they they don't get the news attention we're talking about the ones that are on people's minds now today uh, because these are things that are in the public knowledge but this bill i'm optimistic will also allow for other claims outside of these institutions that are well known to the public right now there are certainly other areas of abuse that are taking place that are not within the news realm. Um, so in terms of the examples of the institutional abuse that we've seen, uh, you know, it's well documented throughout these cases, you know, forcing children to stand for hours, leaving them outside in the snow, hanging them outside of windows upside down, locking them in cabinets for days you know, raping and forcing abortion, uh, cruel and inhumane um, exercise routines, forcing them to re-eat their own vomit, punching and beating them, kicking them downstairs. I mean, it goes on and on. And when I think about this type of abuse, I would love to see this Senate Bill 99 as broad as possible to ensure that every single person who suffered something like this will have an opportunity to bring their case forward. Um, you know, it, it is a high standard. I share that concern. Um, gross negligence is a high standard. So too um, is, is recklessness. I'd be one to take on the cause in some of these certain situations um, and say, you know, we can meet that standard but anything that we can do to ensure that survivors have an ability to bring claims and aren't faced with the challenges that you know, we are, have been discussing today um, is something that we should think about. I, I just wanna push back a little bit about the idea that all institutions are bad, that all institutions are inflicting an epidemic of child abuse ranging from decades in the past. I don't think that's a ac necessarily accurate statement any more than my saying all this particular ethnic group uh, caused trouble in the past or anything else. I, I think it's, um, yes, you have, you know, St. Joseph's Orphanage, you have these others that have come to life. There may be others. But to suggest that every institution in Vermont's history has the history. Um, I, I don't know. The Week School was in operation for years and years and years and years. There may be a record there. I don't know. It was operated by the state of Vermont. Um, but nothing has come forward that I'm aware of recently. And so I, I'm a little bit troubled by that must let you know that. Yes, and I apologize if I misstated that. I certainly don't believe every institution in Vermont or nationwide has these issues. That's, that's, that's clear. Um, it is a small percentage of the institutions that do. There are many that do quite good work for people, many schools there that have no problems at all. Um, it, uh, my, my only point is that there may be some that are not within yeah, the public. There I don't disagree with that. I just, uh, um, I, I'm talking about the epidemic of child abuse in Vermont, institutional care, that that slide, I don't know which number it is. That's fine. Please go ahead. I just needed to say that. I understood, Senator, and I want to be clear that I don't believe that every institution has those issues. It is a small number. Um, it's just some that might not be, um, you know, in the public realm. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, this next slide is just sort of a comparison of some of the issues that had happened at Kern Hatton. Um, obviously, there's there's been great work that's been done on the sexual abuse sides of claims. Um, and now we look at, you know, there could be another uh, person who suffered the serious physical abuse, you know, <clears throat> in terms of being kicked repeatedly in a box and having his head smashed into a toilet. Uh, the results of these, cli these, these clients of ours um, are, have been shockingly similar, despite the fact that there are <clears throat> different types of abuse. Um, they've led to addiction. <clears throat> alcohol and things like that. So this bill, I believe, would actually have a positive impact, at least with respect to some of the Kern Hatton cases, um, to allow these strikingly similar um, outcomes and suffering to both have the opportunity to gain some justice. Um, 
in my past slides, I've talked about the psychological and neuro neurological effects of abuse. I don't think this is anything new to anyone, but clearly uh, the abuse can have influence on all aspects of life, um, including brain development, emotions, relationships, mental health. This is another slide regarding um, uh, deprivation and neglect in childhood that caused serious emotional and cognitive problems in, in the brain itself. Uh, is evidence of that. Um, one of the things that I think is important that is probably behind this bill is delayed disclosure. 33% um, of people never tell anyone that they were ever abused. And the average age in one study that we've looked at with a thousand victims was 52 years. So I think that this bill itself is supported by the science and the delayed disclosure. Um, and I, I think that's important for people to recognize. And the other thing is that it can also have great effects in other areas. Um, statute of limitations reform and repealing the statute of limitations will help identify previously unknown predators and in, in any institutions that are involved in that. Um, it does shift the cost from the victims and society to the perpetrators and the institutions when we're able to recover and put together you know, life care plans that will help these people in the future continue to get the mental health treatment that they need as opposed to having taxpayers pay for that. Um, it also obviously educates the public regarding the types of abuse that are out there. Um, and oftentimes in these cases, when you either go to court or even settle, um, it does result in change in policies and procedures. <clears throat> oftentimes that's a requirement that we include um, in a settlement is to make sure that policies change, procedures change, so that the continued abuse is not something that can take place or that it at least gets limited um, in some ways, and so that there's oversight to affect the future and help to make people safer altogether. So I just want to say thank you all for the opportunity to speak today, to share information um, related to childhood abuse. I'm probably not telling you all anything you don't already know. Um, I do support this bill, and I think it's an important bill that needs to be passed. Um, if there's opportunity to uh, amend it in any way to ensure that the purpose um, is set forth to help situations where children have suffered. I'd be happy to continue to participate with any of you all in the future. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know. I'm if I muted. I was muted. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, are there questions for Kim? Senator Benning first. Kim, you've obviously there's a problem that needs to be fixed here, and that's pretty easy to see. Mm -hmm. But I'm still coming back to the attempted language, and part of your presentation has strengthened my concern. If you believe that the um, case of attempted would be so difficult to prove, it probably would never get there. Why would we leave it in the bill at all? I mean, it seems to me as a responsible legislator, I should be making sure that uh, concerns like that are just not present and available to cause problems. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking a person who has ended up in the emergency room has a very strong building block for a case. Can you take the screen down so we can see people? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Let me let me do that. Stop share real quick. Sorry. Thank okay. you. Sorry, Joe. So a person who ends up in the emergency room has a building block for a case 30 years later. Um, where they don't end up in the emergency room, there is an allegation. Most of the sexual abuse cases and physical abuse cases um, have a long history of a plaintiff having mental problems, um, life problems that have been manifested as a result of the abuse that they suffered. In an attempted situation, I'm struggling. How is it, for instance, if a, a, a kid in a camp um, on several occasions was put in a restraint situation 
I could conceivably see them making an argument that the re reason that they ended up in therapy for 15, 20 years um, and all of their life problems was because they have this repetitive dream of being um, somebody attempting to make an aggravated assault on them. And I'm struggling trying to figure out how to make this all work right. Um, so why would we have attempted in there if you don't think that an attempted case would ever be brought? Yeah, I, I don't wanna speak for the drafters or Mr. Fitzpatrick. I think it just, the way that the bill reads, it relates back to the definition of aggravated assault that Vermont has in a separate statute. And that is the precursor language within that statute. Uh, <clears throat> if there's some concerns regarding it, I think it's just drafting that would need to uh, address that concern yeah, um, so right. that you're not citing back to that statute that defines it and includes attempted. Um, you know, uh, could there be a case of attempted aggravated assault that is actionable? You know, it's just really hard to prove, I think. Um, and I'm trying. Well, it, it would be even harder to defend against after a very long period of time. And it, mm. I don't know. I Thanks for your response. I'm just trying to wrestle in my head how yeah, to. Move I appreciate forward. it. And I understand it and I appreciate that concern, you know. Yes, Senator Baruch. Uh Thanks. And uh, Joe and, and the chair's um, questions about attempted, I'm, I'm starting to think along the same lines. It, it seems like something that we might um, better get rid of at this stage. Um, but Ms. Doherty, you said you'd be happy to work with us in terms of strengthening the bill, if that were a possibility. Do you, do you have any ideas along those lines? Um, you, you know, part of it is what you're talking about here to further clarify um, what attempted means, if there is, and I would need to think on it, whether there's ever any attempted case that could be actionable you know i'm thinking about is was did someone chase someone down with a gun and hold a gun to their head multiple times you know could that be something that um you know I think that's another part of the uh of the aggravated assault statute where it's you actually did have the gun or another piece is drugging somebody you actually did drug yeah. them so yeah. I, I think that the attempted is the the first and second prong of it yeah. instances but yeah I, I think you know I would I would like to study the bill a little further and see if there's some way to um, address the concerns of I think that attorney O'Neill has raised about um, you know collectability and ensuring that we don't re-traumatize people to believe that they're going to now have a, ca a cause of action and in fact not be able to move forward on any type of cause of action. It just, it, th that's an issue that is not necessarily solvable by a bill. Um, it's just case by case scenario. You have to look at whether or not you have a defendant that is in a position where you can collect. Um, so I, I'd be happy to look further and study and think about, you know, are there other ways that we can alleviate any concerns of those types um, and, you know, ensure that there's, there's a broad avenue to seeking justice retroactivity, retroactively, but that doesn't also leave open the concerns that you all have about the attempted language. Okay, appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions for Kim? I, um, I, uh, I'm getting a, if the institution, and we didn't talk about very much, but, but is the standard for the institution the right place? In other words, the gross negligence. You have to prove that the institution was grossly negligent. And I, 
maybe going back to St. Joseph's. Um, there was some, either Mr. O'Neill, who's still with us, or Tim. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, the nuns worked for an order. They were in a facility owned by the diocese. In case it turned happen, there were certain house parents who, who did things that um, both the sexual and physical abuse. Is, is gross negligence that the standard we need? Too high, too low for the institution? Jerry? Senator, I think that's a good standard. I, I think it's a reasonable standard in the context. I know specifically in the context of the child sexual abuse cases that you were the one who thought that the standard of gross negligence was needed as it relates to institutions. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, I do think that we want to hold institutions accountable, but we don't want it to be too easy. Uh, from a plaintiff's perspective, I may be contrary to what others might think I should be saying, but I believe it. And I think the gross negligence standard works because the question is whether or not in a given context, the actions of those who are responsible for supervision, which is really what this is, have acted not just simply negligently, but really weren't paying attention to business in a meaningful way. That's the way I would think of gross negligence, which is really not paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing in a significant way, such that you caused injury, to, permitted injury to occur. Do you have any comment or do you agree? It, it is obviously a higher standard than negligence. Um, but again, you know, you're you're not talking about the perpetrator. You're talking about the people who are supervising the perpetrators, um, and the other people who are acting and, and causing the misconduct. I I'm not sure where I would stand on that. All I can say is that, you know, in the case of Kern Hatton, um, in a lot of the cases that I work on while gross stand negligence is a higher standard, the type of conduct that we're talking about will easily reach that. Um, you know, so it, it, it may not have as much of a real true impact on these cases where the abuse is so severe. Um, the meeting that standard, I feel per particularly in the cases that where I take on is usually pretty, uh, while it's higher, it's attainable because the con misconduct is so, Grave. Well, I, I will say that one of the most surprising aspects of the discussion about Turner in our joint session that um, was it last week, seems like a month ago, um, was the failure to even, even recently, of mandated reporting to not take place. I mean, I. I I just think we spend so much time talking about mandated reporters and spend a lot of time on issues of school teachers and being mandated reporters and what their obligations were, or training to it, or doing all that. And I'm, I'm talking now 2019, not 10 years ago. I'm talking right recently, the failure to, to report. Um, that, that shocked me, actually. Yeah, it's pretty egregious. Um, and that's why in, in that instance itself, you know, I think the gross negligence is something that is attainable, um, particularly in, the, in that case. Um, could, it, could it come to be an issue in other cases where you know, there's a debate between the plaintiffs and the defendants as to what the intent was of the legislature to put in the term gross? I can foresee that too. And I certainly do believe that it will be used as a defense um, to say that, you know, no, 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 it doesn't meet the standards of gross negligence. This is, you know, yeah, we were negligent. Yeah, we didn't see this and we didn't, you know, so I can see it as being a defense in the future. Um, and I appreciate the conversation around this. Um, I don't have the full answer for you um, other than to say, you know, in the cases that I take on, it's usually pretty grossly negligent. Um, and I don't know if Mr. O'Neill feels the same. <clears throat> okay, um, we're going to take a break. Peggy, if you could let 
Uh, I need. I see Sarah Robinson, who's our next witness, is right here. Um, could let them know we're a little bit ahead of time. So if you can let Mary Keo and um, Amy Brady know that we're um, a little ahead of schedule. Uh, we'll do. What time do you want to come back from break? Um, 